circulations have formed, and uh, nobody better to, to talk to you about this than, uh, than, than, than Steve. So, Steve, I'll turn it over to you. All right, thank you, Roger. Uh, today we're going to be talking about the chase in the high plane. We've been chasing the high plane since pretty much the late 1980s, and what this school CSU uh, was there through the early 90s and did an internship down in Florida for a while. And then, so I came back here in 98, uh, and the public office opened a new uh, I wanted to uh, come back to Colorado because I love to do two things. I love to ski and I love to chase. And living down in Pueblo is pretty much the perfect area for that because you're two hours away from great skiing and you're two hours away from pretty much great chasing. Now, when I talk to a few folks here, I tell them what I'm going to talk about here. I said, well, high plane chasing is great. And, well, well, you don't want to say that. You want to say high plane chasing is, is no good. It's no fun because, you know, people who chase high plane know how great it is. And they don't want all the chasers to work as well. We know that's not going to happen. The storm last year in Denver, uh, I think we all know that, what happened there. We, it was kind of fortunate that Highway 36, uh, C. made that some pretty extra fat lanes on that highway. It would have, uh, it would have been a nightmare if that weren't the case. So let's begin here. There we go. I'm going to start with this here. Some, uh, for those who are not familiar with the area, there's some, uh, some uh, 
cities, there's the, there's the three divides I've talked about. I've talked about how important they play roles in meteorology out of here. All right, uh, severe weather climatology. Well, that's primarily through late May through July. June is prime time around here. I think some studies uh, were done earlier by Jim Brash showed that you know, usually around June 10th is the day to be out here in the southeast Colorado. However, we've had things go wrong as uh, March and then late as October. More, they're, they're more synoptic associated system. We'll talk about those. Uh, not supercell tornadoes, we know prior to a big late winter and early spring snowstorms at times. It can all be April and we'll get tornado warnings out from Denver. Uh, mainly they're associated with the DCDZ the circulations. October 1997 was probably the most significant tornadoes that we ever had here in Colorado, but they never hit anything, so they all got rated F1 and F0, but that was a very, very incredible day. Climatology wise, uh, looking through mid May. Of course, it's all down in Texas and central Oklahoma. But as we get through, we get into June, we can see the maximum is right over northeast Colorado, stretching out in Nebraska. But there it is, over in northeast Colorado. And that DCDZ plus it's the cold front, the cold front's coming down, bringing up the favorable up slope, sets the stage. It even lasts until uh, into July. You still have the maximum over our area, so chasing can linger out here, which is kind of nice. And even in August, there's still some severe weather every once in a while. So now, now, for now, what I want to do is I'm going to talk about general synoptic differences between the high plains and southern plains severe weather events. A lot of this stuff came from the dogs, and I'll jump the dogs more. In general, 200 millibars, jet level, southern plains, flow is usually pretty strong. 100 knots, the troughs are coming across, are pretty progressive. However, for our, our neck of the woods, the flow is generally moderate, typically 40, 80 knots, maybe at times. Trough movement is generally slow. For, uh, sub, for the, looking at 500 millibars, mid-level flow, when they're generally greater than 40 knots, 500 mill troughs are deep, sometimes they're closed loads coming across the southern plains, cold air infections, moderate to strong. However, for our neck of the woods, when they're generally 30, 40 knots, 500 millibar troughs are weak or ripples in the westerly flow or short wave of the day, you probably read an AFDs from uh, Denver. Um, cold air infection is generally weak. Southern Plains, 850 millibar level, about 1 to 1.5 kilometers above ground level. However, here on the high plains, 850 millibar level, where you're standing at right now, is currently 0.1 kilometers below your butt. It's just the way it is. It's very important to rip this. This is key for this neck of the woods is you're literally missing one mile in the atmosphere. It's it's just because it's just because of the elevation and it plays a very important role in a lot of things here. It's elevation is key. As in just in general meteorology, when we get a new forecaster in the office, and they spend all these years studying all these dynamics and, and, and meteorology books and this and that, change enforcing and everything, and then you know we have this beautiful map of Colorado in our office. And the first thing I tell them, I point it out, point it out the map and says. See those big rocks to the west on that map, that Colorado map? That's what drives our weather. That's the primary number one force of magnitude. That's why it's so great to forecast here in Colorado. Because things develop over you. Plus, you've got to deal with the terrain. It just makes, it, it makes the job very enjoyable. Very frustrating at times, but enjoyable. That's been another thing I tell the forecaster number day, his first day there, said, leave your ego at the door. Because Mother Nature's gonna kick your butt every time. <laughs> Swear it. Surface, southern plains, surface loads intensifying, rapidly pressure falls, really deep stuff. Well, on our neck of the woods, surface pressures are falling slowly or moderately. Really not. What am I doing? Ah, uh, surface again, severe curves south and east to the left. Supercells in front of us. Dry line, cold front, all that. No, not in Colorado. Severe occurs north and west of the surface levels. Post front, not every time, but the large majority of the time. Surface moisture, surface moisture coming directly from the Gulf of Mexico. Strong southerly flow in front of the storm, brings all that good moisture up. High plains, it's a little bit different. Our, our 
moisture it comes, I would say, indirectly from the Gulf of Mexico. What generally happens is you get, you know, you got your southern deep flow and it brings the moisture up from the Gulf of Mexico. And what happens most of the time is we generally got a, a cold front come down. Now that cold front can't be too strong. If it's too strong, it just rips through, it's strong northwesterly winds behind it, down slopes off the mountains, dries things out. The front's gotta be just right. It can't be, it just gotta be not all that strong, slow moving front comes down. It's so all that high thin air that was over Nebraska and the Dakotas, high drops down, flow shifts from suddenly, from goes by, becomes northeasterly, and that moisture is literally pushed back west into our region. And, then, and that pushing back is very important. You know, I, I mentioned here we have, uh, you know, the, the times we just have a weak diurnal upslope flow, but usually if that's the case, you can't really get supercells going through because the flow is just generally too weak. Convection gets going and it outflows out. But, so you have to have like strong, synoptically forced, easterly component to the wind with a building high pressure coming across. That sets up the shear pattern. You know, I talk about precipitation from the plains. What happens there is you, you get a you get some MCSs get going in, in western Kansas that evening and that night. What happens? That'll send out very good moisture back towards the west. As a matter of fact. Your MCS is a very, very player. very important. If you're storm chaser, you're in the high plains. MCS is in the western Kansas areas are your best friend. And at the time, especially in July, if that transpiration can be important. You know, you from the corn growing out here, all that moisture, and then when you get to the front come through, that kind of helps out a little bit too. Uh, differences of low levels again, dew points generally in the 60s and 70s for the southern plains. However, in Colorado, 50s will do the Matter of fact, most of our tornadic activity that I looked at, the dew points were generally in the 50s, sometimes 40s. Lapse rates, high plains are typically large. Why? Well, it's pretty simple. Elevation. Let's look at an example between two cities, Denver and Oklahoma City. Let's assume both Denver and Oklahoma City have a surface temperature of 27 degrees Celsius or 80 degrees Fahrenheit and a 500 millibar temperature of 11 C. And we'll sit in the height of 500 of our surface is 5.5 kilometers. Denver's elevation is 1.6 kilometers. Above sea level, Oklahoma City is 0.4. All not mistaken. What happens when we just put that in the lapse rate equation? Just by definition, Denver's lapse rate, just with that alone, is almost dry and bad. For Oklahoma City, it's, it's a couple degrees less. Dew points in the 50 are more than sufficient for supercells and tornadoes on the high plains. But the elevation, but is elevation the reason why it is? Well, yes it is. It's best explained by the bubble potential temperature of theta W. Now, but before I continue, um, I don't want to, I have no intention here of keep teaching a thermodynamics. On the other hand, I don't want to make it too simple either, so I hope I don't, in a nutshell, I hope I don't mess this up. So, wet bulb potential temperature theta W was found by reading the temperature off the saturation and advantage of the T down to 1,000 millimeters. And as an example, here's a sounding. You, know, you can bring up your mixing ratio up there and you bring up your, your uh, temperature reading up here and you find your moist data. We have LCL forms and measure moist data you If you want to find the theta W for this sounding, you just bring it down to 1,000 millimeters. And sure enough, it's 25 degrees Celsius. It is not 298 degrees Celsius. That is a simple error of probably negative. It's supposed to be 290. Okay, I apologize for that. <laughs> so that's how you find your um, your uh, David W. So we know that the equivalent potential temperature theta E is related to the wet bulb potential temperature by this simple uh, equation. So, well, it's actually not a simple equation. It's a big long term big equation that's okay. derived. Month we were with the review back later in 1940, but this simple chart pretty much shows the relationship between equivalent potential temperature and wet bulb potential temperature. So why is that important? Well, we know that theta E is a good moisture, a um, good measure of atmospheric instability. And what do we like as storm chasers? We like atmospheric instability. So let's compare Denver and Oklahoma City once again. But let's look at the theta W and wet bulb associated wet bulb temperatures for these two cities. So here we go. For 
Let's assume that Denver, Oklahoma City have a theta W of 293 degrees K. I ain't got to write that time. And that's just right there to say you got. So what happens if we go ahead and find it? find the what bulb temperature for the actual cities that we discussed. Well, for Oklahoma City, 970 millibars, the theta W, the wet bulb temperature, te wet bulb temperature in this case, is 66 degrees Fahrenheit. However, for Denver, it is 56.3. And in that shell, this explains why you can have lower temperatures and dew points at higher elevations and still have strong convection here. And for what it's worth, the theta E for these two cities, two identical cities, is 330 degrees, 330 degrees Kelvin, not Celsius. <laughs> moisture in cave. Low level moisture in the planet is sufficient to keep. It's, it has been found that 150 millibar layer, low level moisture you want. That's just an SPC rule of thumb that the folks at SPC told me a while back. Otherwise, I mean, if, the, if the moisture is too thin, it just tends to mix out, which is not a good thing. Cape is not based solely, uh, it's important to remember, okay, Cape is not based solely on the ambient temperature and dew point. You gotta remember, it's, it, you, know, you, you got your temperature and dew point, you got your moist and so on and so forth, but it's what's happening, what's, 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 you, what's the actual ambient temperature of the atmosphere as you go up. So this, this kind of explains why it, it can be quite cool with low dew points, and you can still get quite a bit of positive cape on the high plains. Yeah. Here's an example of it. Here's an, you know, don't pay attention to any wind, other winds here. I'm going to explain this diagram a little later on with one of my case studies. But, you know, this is Colorado Springs Ob on this day, and there was, a, there was like three or four tornadoes just east of this location. And yet the temperature, the temperature that was feeding these storms was 66 over 54. And you still get quite a bit of cape. I believe the cape up there is like, you know, we're sitting at 1,500 joules per kilometer. And this, this was sufficient. And in the wind field, I promise you, we're going to go that was a great shear pattern on the day. And we had to uh, put it in the I won't move like this. Uh, cape values are typically modest, generally, for severe weather cases here in Colorado, generally 1,000 to 2,000 foot per kilometer. You don't need these big 4,000 cape days. Most of the time, it's just that those values are favorable. It's infrequent, it's, it's, it's infrequent that you do see big cave days on the high plains. If, if, if you do, excuse me, it's generally the atmosphere is capped. Of course, though, every once in a while, there are exceptions that we do get uh, the cap to break. One thing to keep in mind for the K Denver sounding, especially the low levels, may not be Denver. And the reason for this is um, Denver sounding will not indicate the low level moisture profile was occurring a little bit farther on the eastern plains. Classic days where this happens is the morning sounding goes up, um, you're a bit dry and you know, along here on the front range, yet you know, you've got this other CS and Kansas the night before, and all this good low level moisture is coming in. So you as, as a, as a meteorologist, as a storm chaser, need to recognize you, know, you take two thirds of that sounding, the mid levels of it, and you have to put in what's actually occurring, what you forecast the thing is going to occur into that sounding to get a feel for what's actually going to occur later on that day. And I'll show you some examples of this later. Um, as shown earlier, it can be quite cool in supercells can form. Many chasers have commented, the inflow of the high plane of supercells is cold. Well, bring a jacket. Anytime <laughs> you come out here, bring a jacket, because you will need it. And when I go out chasing, you can grab my tripod, my camera, and jacket all the time. Once again, as I mentioned, our cape is dependent on the low, lower level of moisture and the thermal profile throughout the troposphere. The ambient temperature does not have to be warm to have positive cape in the sound. It's very, very important for you to understand it. Don't get hung up on how cool the temperatures are. You know, you know, oh, there's some cape out there, there's 1500 tools supposed to be out there, but the temperature's gonna be 65 degrees, that, that ain't gonna do it. No, it don't, it don't do it. Rasmussen and Blanchard back in 98 found that the best discriminator for supercells in general is a zero to six kilometer shear. Six kilometers here on the high plains is not 500 millibars because you're starting off at it. You're starting off at 5,000 feet, four or 5,000 feet. So the best thing to do, just get a first guess feel of what the deep shear is, is to look at 400 millibars. Of course, the ones at 400 millibars are usually stronger, so your shear will be a little bit better. 
Somebody can't afford a cat going to the deep shear, 400 millibars a week. I suggest that we you should start off. Now, the problem is, what deep shear should you use? Rich Thompson and I kind of had a conversation about this last time. We went to about what we should do, what you should do. Obviously, the positive shear is a better thing to look at than bulk shear. Bulk shear is simple. You pretty much look at the surface winds, you look at the 400 millibar winds, you get a shear. However, we do know that positive shear, true, the actual true, the actual true photograph, is best to look at to get what's, what's actually going on. The problem with that, and Rich Thompson can correct me if he wants to, is the, the shear, if you're looking at, the only way you're going to be able to see positive shear is you've got to look at model data. Well, you could probably look at five separate models for that one particular event that you're forecasting for. Your positive shear is going to vary from model to model. At least with bulk shear, it's not the best, but it, models are pretty good at predicting what the winds are at 400 millibars, and obviously you know what's occurring at the surface. So you can kind of get a feel for what the bulk shear is. So, um, and obviously bulk shear, if I'm not mistaken, is that's the primary thing that you see on the SPC Reso analysis page. Mike, correct there, Rich? Okay. In general, as a forecaster here in Colorado, I have found that 30 knots of cyclonic shear on the high tides will start to get storm spin. This means that 20 knots of western wind at 400 millibars and used to go to 10 knots, there's your 30 knots, can get storm spin. I'm, I'm just saying, in general, we get this is what I've observed over the years. Obviously, you want your shear to be better. 40, 30 knots is best. I believe Rich kind of mentioned that the 40 knots seems to be a much more prudent value. I can see a minimum of 30 knots at 400 millibars. That's, that's when I start getting a little bit excited. Uh, however, there have been several times when the bulk shear has been marginal at best, but impressive cyclic tornadic supercells have formed. May 2010 events come to mind. There's, other, there's also others. Day two, as we mentioned earlier, about cold fronts coming down during the, during the late spring and early summer. The cold front comes through, uh, winds change to an easterly component, things get, can get exciting about here. However, the reason why it is, uh, obviously, as I mentioned, is most of the time, during day one, the air behind a cold front is too stable. That's why you don't get severe weather the day, usually the day of or the day after the front goes by. It just simply may be overcast, the levels of moisture can be high, but the ambient temperature is just simply too cold. It's your cap your, your, your because the colder air is under the warmer air, you've got a cap, and this is not going to happen. Additionally, surface flow on the first day is typically going to be in the northeast direction. This shear profile is going to be uh, cold air infection, and it's not necessarily favorable for rotating storms we like to see. I've, I've seen at times we've got some left turners uh, come across, but it's, it's, it's pretty, pretty infrequent. Uh, does weather normally occur prior to or with the actual front passage? Most of the time, no. Severe weather does not occur with the front passage. Simply the reason why this is, Prefrontal air mass in our area is too dry. The level of wind flow prior to the frontal passage is southwest. It's, the southerly flow here is dry on the, on the high plains. Well, the reason why that is, once again, terrain. Guess which, which, when you got a southerly wind or southwesterly wind, where is it coming from? Remember, you're already a mile high above. It's coming from the dry deserts, Mexico, New Mexico. It's just, it's just rarely, well, I'm not saying rarely, but it's very frequent that we already have the moisture in place prior to a frontal passage. The southerly winds just literally dry things out coming off the higher terrain. By the second day, however, insulation modifies the low level atmosphere so that positive surface phase cables will be alive and thunderstorms can develop. Surface flow also becomes east to southeast. It's being forced by the high pressure off to your east and northeast. It sets up a favorable shear profile for uh, storms that we like to see to develop. However, we do know that for supercells is one thing, but for tornadoes, we have to have the sufficient level of shear, as Rich Thompson discussed earlier. Favorable areas for tornadoes, as uh, Rich talked about, stole my thunder. Uh, that, that, that's okay. DCBZ is well known for producing non supercell tornadoes, land spot tornadoes. This is simply due to the Palmer divide. What happens is that high pressure builds in, southeasterly winds impinge on the Palmer divide causes the winds to, why it does, I honestly don't know, 
cause the blades to become cyclonic and you get this converted setup here. The combination of the, of the high terrain in southern southeast, the wind sets up this north, northeast, south, southwest axis of convergence from just, it's usually just east of Denver. Sometimes it sets up over Denver, back in 88 it did, we all know what happens, once of tornadoes in the city. Sometimes it's farther out, but generally in this area it's very, very, very favorable. At times we can get a true cyclonic circulation that develops, and we kind of see this here. A beautiful example of the DCDZ. You got this uh, southerly winds here going around easterly and coming around. But we even have some westerly winds here in the and the DCD sets up right here. Uh, there's a, obviously an error on this slide. I apologize for that. Um, the moisture can focus, as we discussed, it was discussed earlier, along this DCD boundary. You got the shear here. Um, the city is looking at the increasing dew points along the boundary. You got localized areas of increased cave. Thunderstorms form, you have draft form. Obviously, this is not it's our horizontal vertices, vertical vertices, so I apologize for that. And the DCDZ, on the other hand, can form year round. As a matter of fact, it occurs, I think, about 60%, it can occur about 60% of the time. Uh, when we look back to some, some data earlier with some lightning studies. National Weather Service forecasters in bold of also that Washington County is favorable for very exceptional storms. And that's, I would say that one's kind of exceptional. Uh, this may also be due to local terrain features, but no, we really don't know. This is just an observation from this. Two other areas of higher terrain extend these from the, from the Rockies. You can see the Cheyenne Ridge up here, the Turn Mesa here. These areas also act as local convergence areas, but the surface flow path are not as well organized as they are in the DCDZ. However, we still can get some great storms. There's, there's some nice supercells formed in the Cheyenne years ago, some tornadoes. And, that's the uh, Miracle Day, Memorial Day Miracle on the street. It's a tornado down towards the bar there. Supercell tornadoes. Day two events can be favorable for supercells, but for supercell tornadoes, you still need to enhance the below level shear. Case studies have shown that significant day two tornado events can be traced back to boundaries. Old alpha boundaries are brother in convection, especially as, as I mentioned earlier, MCS and West Canada have really do good things for us. And some of this stuff has been written up over the years, the Lyman Colorado case back in 1990, we'll discuss and some of the May 2010 events that we'll trace back the boundaries. So let's look at several case studies. And we'll look as many as possible until I run out of time, or maybe I'll finish up with time. We'll see how it all works out. So keep me on this go over there. First thing I want to talk about, obviously I work down in Pueblo, so I really focus on that, what's going on down there. And I'm, you know, I'm a severe weather media in the office, so I kind of take care of all the severe weather statistics down there. This is a chart that shows the um, number of tornadoes per day. So in other words, we had a bunch of tornadoes since 1995, and 85 of those, 85 of those events, only one tornado occurred that day. Well, here we had two tornadoes occur this day 24 times, three tornadoes occurred, uh, three, three tornadoes occurred, one day, seven times, blah, 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 etc. However, we see these outliers here. And uh, we know we want to see you know, what the heck was going on during these days. So let's go look at let's go look at the meteorology here. Now, these case studies I want to show, I'm not, they're not going to be extensive details case studies for every probably have four, seven, eight slides for each one, and you know, that's not a detailed analysis, but just enough to kind of give you a feel of what was going on. So the, the, the days of these were May 29, May 2001, 22 April of 2010, and 25 May of 2010 of these big days. So for the Lamar, you know, the May 2001 case, the Lamar Colorado host fest, as they call it, um, <laughs> ten, to, 10 tornadoes occurred in southeast Colorado, seven were in the Lamar vicinity. Um, they were all from the same storm. The first six were non supercell tornadoes. The last one developed in what we believe is an F3 supercell tornado. <laughs> Now, this, this is not all that common in Colorado, or not uncommon. You'll get initially storms will get up, there'll be land, produce land spouts, and evolve into cells as time goes by. First tornado reported at number 49 a.m. This is something else that occurs around here that you gotta be aware of. Things can go early in Colorado. <coughs> as you'll see. 40, you know, 500 millibar chart for this day, this morning. Um, 12Z, we kinda see, you know, not really nothing all that fascinating going on. Just, you know, a week or trough coming through, temperatures nice and cold and low, which is a good thing. Remember when we discussed about having the temperatures aloft being cold. 
Um, and your temperatures and dew points at the surface can be not all that spectacular. So let me open a brief little trough coming through. <coughs> and here's a surface plot for this day, or for, for around the time when the tornadoes occurred. The first tornado occurred about 1745Z-ish. This is 18Z. We kind of see that you know, temperatures are not, not too shabby. It's a case where dew points were pretty high. Not that they were, there's some rich moisture, maybe E axis coming here with these 60 dew points. I don't know about the 68 here, I think that level is always, always running a little bit high. So we kind of got the state E axis coming across in here, and if we go ahead and look at the visible satellite, kind of pretty much tells the picture of what was going on. So we had, we had the trough moth coming in, the cool air coming in, we have a nice boundary setting up right here, and that's when the show began. And this is what was this, this, this is the beginning of the tornadic tornado.